All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Hello, and welcome to the Brick Cave Media. Now, I have come up with a whole new name for what we're doing with these little uh, online panels. I'm calling them the Webcast In Event Zoomopolis Events. Say that three times fast. Uh, welcome to the Brick Cave panel. Can you separate the writer from the work with Louise Robertson and Sharon Skinner? My name is Bob Nelson, uh, based in Mesa, Arizona. Ricky Media is a publisher of science fiction, fantasy, poetry, and curiosities. Titles published include the latest books from our speakers today, the experiment known as Rosemary Hernandez Williamson, a science fiction book from Louise Robertson, and The Exile's Gift, a fantasy from Sharon Skinner. Both are available from your favorite bookstore or online at brickcavemedia.com. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about our panelists before we get started today. Sharon Skinner. Sharon holds a, a BA in English, an MA in creative writing, and a poetic license. She's worked as a landscaper, a cashier, a maid, a waitress, a communication specialist, a videographer, a technical writer, a project management consultant, a biofield medical and service engineer, and served aboard the USS Jason as one of the first women assigned to a U.S. Navy ship. Her poetry and fiction have been published in, in myriad local, national, and international publications. Sharon is an active member of SCBWI, the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, and currently serves as the regional advisor for SCBWI Arizona. Louise Robertson has earned, has earned degrees, a BA Oberlin MFA from George Mason University, poetry publications, including Pudding Magazine, Crack the Spine, Borderline, among others, and Poetry Awards. Mary Roberts Reinert, Columbus Arts Festival Poetry Competition twice, among others. She has slammed both at the regional and national level, and someone once said about her that underneath it all, she's kind. We do ask, uh, well, it's just you, Paul, so I'm not even gonna bother saying that next part. <laughs> With that, I would like to go ahead and welcome our panelists and turn it over to them. So welcome to you, Sharon, and welcome to you, Louise. Thanks for having me, us. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here. So, so Louise, it's late where you are. I see you're drinking your coffee, uh, so you can uh, stay awake. Uh, I hope we, uh, we can keep everyone awake. Uh, I'm kind of interested to, um, to hear your take on this topic. I'm, I'm very... Um, I will say that this topic of can you separate the writer from the work or the artist from the art that um, is always timely. There's always, uh, but right now I think it's even more um, timely than ever because we've had so much stuff in the news lately about the way that people are speaking uh, in and being in the world that is uh, maybe not how we want our creators to be in the world if you know it so so really i guess i don't know if you read the open letter to jk rowling that someone published recently but um they were calling her out on her anti-trans uh statements that she's made and what was interesting to me is that in the letter the person who was calling her out on this um <clears throat> was talking about how this has gone on for a number of years that I, and it was under, under my radar. I, I, I totally have to admit that this was, it went, went right under my radar. And, um, and I feel like, again, I'm getting gobsmacked with stuff I really should be more uh, alert to in the world. Uh, I'm trying, I'm trying, but, um, but I, you know, it's that kind of a thing. And so now, when we think of Harry Potter and we start to read Harry Potter and, you know, we see it in a different light. We see the characters from a different perspective and we see some of the narrative intrusion perhaps that takes place that we might not have recognized otherwise. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think in the wake of the Me Too movement, we've all become a lot more sophisticated. And so, well, we, this, you're right, exactly, I totally agree. This is an evergreen topic and we can, but we can still bounce from looking at past authors who are gone, their work at body is closed, to current authors. J.K. Rowling, um, I did read that letter. She, she commits another sin, so to speak, that a lot of people tend to, 
are, are criticizing more and more that she seems to want to backwards make her writing more inclusive. Like, oh, Hermione's black. Hermione is not black. <laughs> she did not write her that way. You can't retroactively make yourself more woke. So like she, J.K. Rowling is great because like she 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 does have the anti-trans things and she does have this body of work with like Dobby's a veritable slave, you know, like what is that? Why is that there that she never addresses the really problematic things? But also she is not sophisticated enough to say Mia culpa. I wrote what I wrote, that's what it was, that's who I was, I hope I'm better, you know. And time and again, we see, like, when, it's funny, when um, uh, uh, Louis C.K. got in so much trouble, I'm like, oh, here's an intelligent guy. Let's see what he has to say. He might actually come up with something intelligent. And yet he didn't really. He just said, oh, you guys, poor little me. And he whimpered, you know. So J.K. Rowling is just such a perfect storm of past mistakes, the inability to know how to just say, it is what it is, move on. And then also like even more problematic stuff. So I like that you brought her up. Um, yeah. Well, she's, she's in the news. So she's, she's really in the forefront right now. She's, uh, she's on my mind, partly because um, I missed some of that early on. And, and I'm, I'm a person who is, I, I'm working all the time to try and learn things and grow. Um, I want to be a lifelong learner. I want to be paying attention. I mean, it's one thing for me to look at, say, Marion Zimmer Bradley. Mm -hmm. Marion Zimmer Bradley, who I was, I adored her Mists of Avalon. I was so involved in her worlds and her story and her feminism, right? And coming at the <laughs> Arthurian story from a feminist perspective. And it was, you know, and then, we, <laughs> and then we find out she was a child abuser and a uh, child molester. Um, she, yeah. she, I just, I'm, I'm like, I, I, I have her. So here's my dilemma. I already owned her books. They were already on my shelf. Yes. They were such a formative part of who I am as as a writer myself in fantasy and strong female heroes. Hi, John. And and yet I can't read them anymore. I can't I can't go in and read the stories anymore. Especially, you know, I had a, I had already had some trouble with the whole incest component, mm -hmm. but it was true to the myth. I you know, and yet now it's I find it really really difficult to even consider cracking the spine of that book again. You bring up a really good point because you have texts that are problematic and lives that are problematic. You know, like you can, like I, the person I have the most trouble with uh, right now is Highland. Like I've read it all. He changed my life with Friday because it was a female character. You didn't see too many of those. I'm like, oh my God, it's a female character. Oh my God, I feel so validated. We tried to go read it. It's so, like, I tried Stranger in Strange Land again, could not do it. It was too, it was so sexist, but that's the work. And we can take the work, but if they. But for his time, he was actually yeah. writing some feminist literature. Yeah. He's a confusing guy for, for us because, as, as women, especially, because, of, because he did have strong female heroes, but then he sexualized them and he yeah. objectified them because, yeah, and and to a point, he was a man of his time. So you know, there there's a there's a piece of that, and but the there was also the incest component in a couple of his books that was problematic. Um, the time travel one, where the eleven year old girl ends up marrying the thirty year old guy after she comes of age because they felt yeah right. So yeah. there's some, there are some problems, but again, you know, he also was a liberal when he started writing. He was very liberal. He, he moved to conservatism, but he started writing as a liberal. And so a lot of his ideas were liberal ideas that we, we embraced and we, and especially for our time and our age, I was yeah. a teenager when I started reading Heinlein. So, yeah. um, you know, for the time and, and who we were and who, you know, it, yeah, you're journey. right. He was progressive, but the, it, it's, 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 
and you're right, you have to put him in his time. He was progressive, and he was hailed for even having, like, if you look at some of his contemporaries, women were just bimbos lying around to be tripped over and sexed up, you know, like, and yet you read that they're so, they're very rapey, they're like, and also my consciousness when I was reading them was not like it went over my head. I right. recently told somebody about one of my very favorite books, Alfred Bester, uh, The Star's My Destination. I hadn't read it for 20, 30 years. And she's, she reads it, my friend, and she goes, oh, that's very rapey. And I'm like, <laughs> I guess, uh, it was, but it was okay. my favorite. So, so let's, you know, okay, let's segue real quick into, okay, okay we're talking about writers. We're tr I'm trying to stay focused on writers, but John Wayne. So you want to talk about somebody who's super problematic and white supremacist, homophobic, and his films were very rapey. Like, The Quiet Man. Yeah. Like, you know, um, yeah. Or, or as a matter of fact, you want to go even a step further when he played an um Genghis Khan I didn't see it but I believe you <laughs> oh no it is beyond the pale and you know not that not to mention the fact that they had to paint him up to make it and you know his eyes to make him look Asian um yeah no there's a whole it's just not it's not pretty and you you think back to that and that's the stuff we were we were grow, growing up on and that's the stuff that was normalizing that kind of behavior in our world so for us, especially as women, it's been it's been a journey of many yeah. steps to push past that um, that kind of worldview. Yeah, John Wade is interesting. I mean, I like I think it's interesting about it's causing a furor about the airport. You know, you, you mentioned yes, it. I think in your emails, like, but he's an actor. Like, right? I think. You know. oh, but he's, like, <laughs> like, he's an icon. He's an American icon as of actors, right? Um, yeah. You know, I guess Ronald people. Reagan has an airport too, and he was an actor as well. But yeah, uh, yeah, I, yeah, um, yeah. But uh, and 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 John Wayne, I know in his personal life was very problematic. He was overtly anti racist, overtly white supremacist. Um, and then also, but the work he did was somebody else's writing too. So it's not pure John Wayne on the screen. Um, and, and I think we can engage in a little more of relativism, like the past is a different land. I forget who says that. You know, you have to, the culture is different. You have to understand where and when things are. But even there, you do know that other people were capable of rising above it. So, you know, they might get a pass, but it's like a getting a C plus, you know, I guess, <laughs> you know. I guess. Well, okay, so um, Orson Scott Card, I won't read him. Yeah, right? I read a lot of his books. <laughs> and, I, and I won't go near him anymore. But so so yeah. what, le what that leads me to is, um, what that leads me to is to say, back to, I still have some of these books on my shelf, like um, Marion Zimmer Bradley's books. I haven't been able to part with them um, because they have bad meaning and because I'm a little bit on the hoarder side anyway with books, especially. I, I have trouble parting with books, but, um, but, but now I can't read it, but sitting on my shelf, right? Um, so, so where do we draw the line about, you know, I want my dollars to go to people I support and whose beliefs I support um, and who I agree with in, in the ways of the world that I think that my worldview match with. Um, so here we are, we know about, um, the, I don't know if you're familiar with what's going on in uh, the uh, science fiction and fantasy world right now, but there's a whole lot of stuff coming out about some particular uh, male authors who have um, harassed, sexually harassed and bullied uh, female creators and authors, at, especially at cons and things like that. Um, and I've met a couple of these people and didn't like them when I met them, didn't, couldn't read their work anyway. So for me, that it's like, oh, well, I wasn't going to read their books anyway, right? But, but had I been a person who was reading their books, now what do I do, right? Do I just, you know? For me, I want my money to support people whose worldview matches mine. So I don't want to buy their books. I don't want to support them because I don't want to support that type of 
uh, world attitude and that kind of behavior. But it becomes problematic because um, you can put your money where you feel comfortable putting your money, but where do we draw the line and, and how does that play into uh, cancel cult uh, culture? Can what's it? Cancel culture. So cancel culture, which is the new thing that people do where they just like cancel people out or they're trying to cancel people out on Twitter and social media and all this. This is a very new kind of thing to me. Are you familiar with cancel culture? Yeah. I think so, that it's always been around to some extent. We have, I mean, Twitter's an outrage machine, you know, so they're ready. <laughs> they are ready to get mm -hmm. outraged. And I think like with a lot of things, people who get canceled, I mentioned Louis C.K., um, uh, a season sorry, like people kind of evolve into the next thing. Rarely do people like look at Woody Allen. Woody Allen should be totally canceled. <laughs> like, and he is, and then he isn't. So, you know, people, you know, and I find I personally find if I really have a problem with somebody, I can't read them. So I don't, um, you know, and I think, you know, that's just something. You know, no, but, but, but the complication is nobody's perfect. You know, you can go through and find a picture of me in a kimono. What the hell was I doing that for? Well, somebody, a white guy was pressured me into doing it, but there I am, you know, in a kimono and I'm embarrassed to tell, I look embarrassed. I was embarrassed. I was doing something I wouldn't have done now, would have been more forceful with now with more thinking about it. So you know, I, I feel like the cancel culture, while it's there, it's always been kind of there. You know, people have always discovered something about people and then decided to, you know, react strongly and, and you know, uh, I'm trying to think of, oh, uh, Pee Wee Herman. He got canceled a long time ago. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I, but I do think that with uh, Twitter especially is an uh, outrage machine and that they're always looking for somebody or something to chew up and spit out and be angry about. Well, I think too, though, that we, we know more now about our, um, our creators and our heroes and, you know, we, we, we see more of them in the world. For example, Mel Gibson, right? Will not, right? I will not watch another Mel Gibson movie. I don't even care if it's a rerun. I don't want them to count me as a tick on, a, you know, something shit. Um, or Kevin Sorbo, you know, I was a big fan of Xena and Hercules and all that stuff. And now I can't watch another, I cannot watch Kevin Sorbo at all. And I own those. Again, mm -hmm. I'm looking at them going, well, I can't even sell these because that's not appropriate. I can't take them to the used bookstore. I feel like that I'm just dumping ugly on somebody else. I'm like, what do you do with this stuff, right? Right. What do you do? That we know so much more because yeah. of media and social media and all of that. So if, if we didn't know, because you don't know what you don't know, right? Yeah, it would be out there anyway. You know, Walt Disney and his anti-Semitism totally influenced massive portions of the American culture. Uh, but if I, but, oh, he's a bad example because he lived in a time where there were a lot of anti-Semites and it wasn't like he was closeted or secret and it, it, it influenced anything. Um, uh, I, I, I think that I agree with you. You don't want to sell something because then it pushes the, the information out there. Uh, you don't want to destroy because it just seems a little wrong to destroy. I do have my offending books. I keep them. They're good as references when I need to look up and say, look at this scene. There it is. That's where it happens. Well, they're good. They're good mentor texts for what not to do. As I <laughs> tell my workshop students, there are mentor texts that you use to influence how you write. And there are mentor texts that you use to influence how you don't run it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, there's a, a scene in a Game of Thrones book that is so horrendously badly written that it's my lovely example. I love having this example of how not to write women, <laughs> you know, like uh, it's in one of the first books, the cat, the mother uh, walks across a courtyard. And I, I believe the text to paraphrase says something from her point of view, she's thinking that she's carrying her breasts across the courtyard. And it's like, that's so, really? 
That, really? That's uh, what you that, think yeah, that is your head? Like, mm-hmm, like yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, that goes back to that goes back to something that um, Linda Sue <laughs> Park talks about. I don't know if you're familiar with Linda Linda Sue Park. She's uh, very well known in the kid lit arena. She wrote uh, "Long Walk to Water," uh, uh-huh. which is a fabulous um, nonfiction book, but it's uh, kind of story storyized. Um, about two rival tribes in uh, Africa, in a, in a part of Africa, and, and, and their struggle to get water to the village. It's, it's a beautiful book. Um, I highly recommend it. But Linda Sue Park uh, talks about writing outside your lane, right? And she has this wonderful way of describing it. And I think, um, I, I don't think it was Jason Reynolds, it was um, Kwame who said, uh, it talks about, um, uh, your kitchen table, right? And, and you picture the people around your kitchen table. And the way that Linda Sue Park kind of pulled that kitchen table analogy up forward and talks about it for writing is she says that um, if you are sitting around the kitchen table and having a meal with certain individuals, those are the individuals that you can feel free to write about, you can feel right, free to include in your book, you can feel comfortable that you are writing from inside your lane. Those are the people that you know well enough and intimately enough to write those stories. If you have someone whose kitchen table you've sat at and or who's sat at your kitchen table, you know enough about them to maybe know enough to include them as a character, but not as a primary or secondary character in your book. Um, And you still need to do your homework on understanding their culture and understanding who they are as a person um, to be included. And then if there are people that are not seated at your table and you haven't ever sat at their kitchen table and had a meal with them, maybe, maybe not. Maybe you should think about not uh, writing or trying to write them into your story or writing your story. So that goes back to the whole, um, you know, what do you, you know, writing a very bad woman from a men's per- perspective. If right. you're writing that far outside your lane that you can't even get that right, yes. that's problematic. He's not a woman at his table. <laughs> um, I think he just, la- like, it just was a bridge too far for him. A lot of men have trouble. I, I don't I don't really understand why they think they have to write us so differently than themselves, but um, we're not people. We're yeah. strange creatures. Yeah, mysterious and unknowable. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. That's that's a good analogy. Um, and I I I also think that like if you as a writer, you know, I'm a white writer, and if I want to support, um, you know, I can have black characters. There's plenty of black people have been at my table. I can, you know, lots of diversity. My friends. I have a lot of um, uh, uh, affection for the them and cultures that they have. Um, but it's also true that if I want to support and I, I can always amplify the voices of someone else. I mean, like, I don't always have to only support by writing the character. So that is another way that is sometimes writers don't realize. Sometimes you throw the ball to somebody else and let them run with it. And that's, that. I'm so glad you said that because that's one of the things that Linda Sue talks about. If if it's somebody who's not at your table and you haven't been at their table, maybe, just maybe, you throw the ball to somebody else and say, this is not my story to write, but I have this, you know, story that I think should be in the world. Um, so, and I believe that it was, it, no, um, it was Kwame Alexander who came up with the kitchen table analogy to begin with, and it was Linda Sue Park who I saw talk more deeply about it. That's, thank you. I, it took me a second to get the names. But, uh, yeah. yeah. But 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 also um, I know that in my book uh, I did have I, I had it forward about a hundred years and I had assumed that the cultures had blended a little um, so I I put in people like people I knew and were friends with um, not they weren't in the book but characters similar backgrounds were in the book you know some of them were modeled after people I knew or um, so I did but I was trying to. I was trying to put uh, like a non all white cast in there. And right. um, so even the main character is half Puerto Rican, but she's sort of the second generation. And I know a lot of second generation 
immigrants, like they're not immigrants, but you know, their grandparents. And I talked to some of them just to see how they feel about things. So, you know, but I also kind of want to magically make Puerto Rico a state and, you know, like, I, I don't know, well, I just don't yeah. like Puerto Rico. So that was there, you know. Well, that goes back to that. If you, if you have them at your table, yes, but maybe you need to dig deeper and do more research. And it sounds like you have, it sounds like when you went to include uh, people of that culture that you dug deeper and that's really I think kind of the, the gist of that whole table, um, kitchen table. Well, I kitchen. had the out of having the culture of the spaceship. That was the main culture for her. Right. So, you know, yeah, I was, I, I could, uh, say I, and that's one of the struggles that uh, a second generation Americans sometimes talk about is having that uh, disconnect from the, their grandparents' culture. And so actually I wrote that into the book a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So metaphorically on the spaceship, but it wasn't really about that, but it was, that was kind of what was behind that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I think that what we're talking about um, introduces some of the ways writers are really diving deeper into these issues for themselves. Like, I think, uh, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, I would have written something else or I might have gone harder in a different way and then hopefully evolved out of that and well yeah to, well, to your point um what's the book ember days or um what um what's the name of that book so there's a ya author who just pulled a book because um she was writing uh she's from the south and she was writing about a, a gucci um culture about the gucci culture and she's not of that culture and she oh. was writing about a conjure woman and she has no direct experience with that so she was trying to take the folksy folk tale type of gucci conjure woman story and and they actually just pulled the book it was just supposed to be released uh in the next couple of months and yeah. they did a cover reveal and she decided to pull it and to me, that's, that's guts. That's some bravery right there. That's owning it. Oh, that's and a crazy. risk too. Yeah. Um, I'm going to fly in something that's a well-known uh, way of thinking about things from poetry that um, pe I think people can use as a strategy. And ever since I heard about it in college, um, there's something called Poetry of Witness. And I always felt like it gave me permission to witness something. I'm not going to take somebody's experience away. I'm not going to try to speak instead of somebody. But I certainly am allowed to witness and and approach things that way. You know, I think that's uh, something we need to think about. We can't like, I'm not going to make all of my books all white just because I'm white. You know, but just I have to learn to draw the line of where I can inhabit and speak for or instead of someone because I've always sort of abhorred the idea like I've heard plenty of writers speak say things like I speak for and I speak you know and I'm like well no you speak for yourself <laughs> uh, that person can speak for themselves you know but you are allowed to witness things and it's been a very powerful that's, thing for that's me. a great way to look at it because you can't be inside someone else's skin yeah. But you can, um, you can witness, uh, you, you know, my, my books are populated with a lot of people who are not, uh, cis white, mm -hmm. you know, say, uh, you know, gender people. And part of it is, is that that's because that's the real world. I want real world reflection, but of course my books are not about the issues around, um, their differences they just happen to live in the world they are they exist in my world and um i work very hard to make them real people because i want the the because in my world those people exist i've had those people sit at my table i've sat at their tables you know those people are part of my world and so i do populate my world with people who are not just like me and i think that that's important um I do think that own voices is, is critical. And I think that that's, that's playing an important role. And I know that um, when we talk about it in the kid lit world, um, I've had people push back on it. And my, my response is no, nobody's asking you to get up from the table and leave. 
They're just asking you to add a chair, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. they just want well, you to Paul add a chair. has asked a quite or made a comment, and I really like the point he brings up. He says, whenever I see a TV show with a disabled character, the writers think the character's main goal is to walk. And that's the kind of nuance somebody who is able you know, or ableist doesn't even grasp because they're, they're no, they're so far outside of that experience. They don't even know that nuance. And uh, I want I like, this is a little bit divergent from this. I, I'll bring up two TV shows. One is um, a ve the very popular um, uh, Frankie and uh, Grace, I think the one with um, uh, Jane Fonda and Lily oh, Tomlin. Okay. And then their ex-husbands are gay and they get married. But both thats both straight people are playing the gay couple. And you just feel it's a little shallow. It's a little one-dimensional. They don't, there's something about the relationship. And then I'm going to compare it to a British comedy called Vicious. Um, that is hilarious. And it has, uh, it, it has a gay couple and it's played by, oh, the guy who was Magneto. Uh, I'm trying to remember, but, the, but the, it's, a, it's almost a, it's just a, a romp as it were, but there's so much nuance in the characters because it's authentically portrayed and authentically written in like uh, the more feminine uh, um, character. At one point they're planning a wedding and he goes, I am a man. And it's like, that's the kind of nuance a straight writer wouldn't understand how to insist on the gender from inside a contract they're unfamiliar with, you know, I just, you know, yeah. And uh, Paul, um, Paul adds all other aspects are glossed over, right? Because, you yeah. know, when you're ableist, you're sort of mono focused on like the one thing, that's all they see. So that's a really good point, Paul. Yeah. Um, I, I and I, I'd like to add, this just happened today, a friend of mine, an author I knew in college, put out on Facebook, he writes, what topic should I write for a cast, all women over 40? And I said, I'm going to say, Peter, I did say, get a partner who's a woman over 40. Like, how are you doing? Like all these beautiful friends of his, women over 40 and 50, gave him all this wonderful advice. It's like, and all the advice wasn't the same, but each was authentically nuanced. I'm like, you can pick any of these wonderful women who are trying to help you because any of these perspectives is going to be more than yours. I don't know. He didn't respond. <laughs> well, and I think going back to what Paul was talking about is, you know, the whole idea that we only see people in one aspect we see one aspect and, and we see it through our own lens we don't see yeah. it through other people's lenses right yeah yeah you know and that that's you know it's i i like what you 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 were talking about making sure to include like a diverse cast that way you can have people at least they're there in the room and you can you know always interview to try to flush it out but yeah Sometimes he has to turn a show off. When they talk about a person that wants to walk, or they well the the idea is that the person said if they can't walk they don't want to live and so then paul says how do when they look at me they think that i feel like i want to die or something i think living if i'm in this condition is what they're kind of saying when he hears when someone says that <laughs> When he writes about a new character, he tries to find out about the background of that group. That's that, and that's a really good point too, because Paul, you you lead a hugely full life. I mean, you've got multiple uh, degrees, and you've written. You're you're working on your second book. I mean, you're leading an extremely full life. You're not letting this, you know, hold you back. And um, 
there, yeah, the idea that, oh, just because you are uh, differently abled or, or have some sort of a, a disability that you wouldn't want to live is, I think it's offensive, right? Yeah, yeah it is. It's like, it's like carrying my breasts across the room, offensive, <laughs> right? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. That's a good point. Yeah, I think we've kind of gotten off topic from oh, where right. we started a little bit. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, but this okay. has been a great discussion. I really, um, I know we were trying to, you know, can, so really to, to kind of push us back on topic, it comes back to, you know, can you separate the, the writer from their work? But also, if as a writer, we need to be authentic, right? We need to make sure that what we're um, doing, not only in our, in the, in our work, but in the world is authentic, right? I try to be a really good human being. I try to be authentic in the world. I know that my beliefs probably don't line up with just everybody's. I'm sure they don't. Uh, I have some, you know, pretty liberal ideas about stuff, but, um, but I also re think that my work reflects that and it reflects my worldview. Um, so, and I think that that's really important. Yeah, I also think like with the authors that I read, it's um, okay to let them evolve into another kind of person. Like you, so like you, um, I understand that people make mistakes. Um, sometimes you can't get past it. Like I cannot read certain authors anymore. Like you were saying, you can't like everybody has their line, but it is okay to me. It's always, it's important um, when people can grow. And yeah, so, yeah, so, yes, if you own your stuff, if you will, if, if you can own it and, and, and learn from it and grow, there's, I, I grant a huge level of respect to that, uh, that one of these um, names that's being um, put out in the science fiction and fantasy community um, as one of these authors who, um, who's being called out for their behavior against women at cons and things like that has actually apologized very sincerely. Now, do I know him? No. Do I know what if his behavior has changed? No. But, you know, I, that goes back to that whole thing that I was asking about cancel culture because I was watching a, a, pod, a podcast or a video, a vidcast called Breakfast Club and uh, there was a gentleman on there, I think his name was Eric, um, Eric, Michael Eric Dyson and he was talking about, you can't, you can't cancel people. People cannot be canceled. Cancel culture doesn't really exist. You can't technically cancel anybody. You can ignore them. You personally cannot support them in, you know, in their efforts. But you, as a person, you can't cancel them. People are not cancelable. And I found that to be really kind of mind blowing for me. Yeah, but true. so but true. people can lose their jobs. <laughs> That people can and have lost jobs, um, and you know, you. I'm thinking of, um, wow, well, uh, blanking on his name, but he's a writer. Uh, well, I'll I'll segue to a different point. Um, uh, Kurt Vonnegut, fantastic writer, one of my faves, big influence on my life. I was reading his personal essays, and I'm like hold on, <laughs> you have a real problem <laughs> with mothers and women. And I'm like, but it's not really, he transcends it in his work. Like I, I don't remember, maybe I'm wrong, but he doesn't have a problematic women in his work all the time. I don't know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I guess I kind of handed to Vonnegut that he had these <laughs> issues, I don't know. I well, think it's very weird to read. I think as writers, there's always a autobiographical components to our work, right? There's, yeah. And, and I write, you know, it, after about the third or fourth book, I looked down and I went, oh, I write about mother-daughter issues. I wonder <laughs> why. You know, not that I have anything to work out, right? <laughs> Yeah. Well, okay. And another twist is I was trying to think of uh, Alexi Sherman. Well known. He wrote his best known book is The Absolute True Diary of a Part-Time Indian, right? Right. Um, 
wonderful to have he's a great writer wonderful to, to be able to like just one more wonderful star in the galaxy of many wonderful writers i read his most recent memoir essay book and it was he went in really hard on being an ally into the paint very deep up to his neck whatever metaphor you want to use he was there he had all these solemn things to say about rape and men abusing women the whole book and then it comes out <laughs> do you know where this is going it's yeah. like okay i see what you've done and you made the same moves a lot of men have done a position of power you try to use it to get sex you try to use it to get people but you just spent a whole book pretending to be an ally, you know. A season sorry kind of did that too, but not so deep in either direction. Is he had this whole his show uh, had he was like very ally, 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 and then it comes out hey, he's a complete dickwad. Excuse me. He is. I don't know how much you're gonna edit this. So not a he child program real, now. Yeah, he had a problematic date. Let's just say that. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah so so. I, so yeah so it really for me it it does impact for me it's hard to separate i mean i guess the bottom line for me is that it's hard to separate once you know things about a person it's hard to separate them from the art right it's it, yeah it sounds like when you allow you for a little moral relativism right and little. especially if you start to read deeper and you yeah. because of the stuff and you don't even have to read deeper. Some some of that stuff just jumps off the page and slaps you in the face that you probably didn't see before. Now it's yeah. like in your face, in your face, in your face. How did I not see this? But it's those nuances. Yeah. And and it goes back to how we view art and how we read and how we come to story. And every single one of us comes with our own set of lenses that we see the work through so i i always tell the story about if i had a if i were an artist and i painted this great masterpiece in my opinion this beautiful painting and someone bought it from the gallery and then i one day met that person and they were like oh i love your work i i i own your one of your paintings it's my favorite painting i have it in a place of pride in my house and they show me a picture of where the painting is and it's in the middle of their living room it's like covering the wall and it's upside down what do i say to that person right what do i yes. say to that person? i would say i'm so glad you love my work thank you for being a fan of my work i so appreciate it would i ever tell them it was upside down hell no because they are seeing my work through their lens and they love it so yeah. whether they so i have readers who read at different levels of my you know, when they read my books and they they go deep, some of them, and some don't go very deep, but they all love the work or they enjoy, at least enjoy the read. And for me, you know, you're coming with your own lens, you're coming with your own worldview, you're coming with your own, um, you know, everything that you've lived through and what's brought you to this place. And you're seeing my work and you, you have somehow resonated with my work. I'm okay with however that is. I'm okay with it because I, I want that connection. That's what the work is about for me in my books is making an emotional connection with people. Not I don't, I'm not specific about what, what emotional connection I'm making. That's for them. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, I, I think um, my motivation is to create, to build a world. Um, and that's, I maybe haven't thought about it as much as you have, but um, ideally I want to build a world and live in it and um, make interesting things happen. Uh, my, the novel doesn't really have a villain, but the next one kind of does, but they all mostly have cold heart whatever world building happens you know that's one of the most interesting like i did the short story for the um the anthology and that was uh, like a pure world building exercise and i loved it so that's a huge motivation to me i just 
really love to create worlds and make them cool and live in them. And then you invite people to live in them with me too. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. And uh, I know that a lot of people, I know a lot, some my, there's a, a couple of professors who teach my poetry and I occasionally know what the students have written about my work. And sometimes I'm like, <laughs> All right, <laughs> you know, okay. Well, uh, but, but yeah, I'm glad you're there. <laughs> that's, that's like the critics who said that um, Robert Frost's poem, Stopping by Snow, uh, Woods on a Snowy Evening, was about death, and he kept saying, no, no, it's not. It's <laughs> about stopping by. But what you're saying is people evening. get what they get out of it, and if you have a rich tapestry, you know, I mean, I hate to make this analogy, but SpongeBob SquarePants. You can watch it as a child because it's pretty colors. You can be a little bit older and snarky. And then you can be the adult there uh, identifying with Squidward the whole time. <laughs> sarcastic. Like, it's many, 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 I, this isn't my idea. I'm totally ripping somebody off. I, I can't remember who, though. It's but you know, though. it's a bar. Like, people get what they get. And then you set it free in the world. And it has to be free. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. 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 Oh, but I did want to bring, swing in another um, uh, issue that you touched on when I was talking, we were talking about um, past authors and being used to a certain world. Um, I recently, uh, I, I read and reread a couple of the books out of a series, the Murderbot series by Martha Wells, and she's um, insisted on having gender parity. Like the number of men and women are both matched, matches the real world and it's almost mind-blowing because i'm like why are there so many women in this book no 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 it's just i'm used to reading books where it's mostly 80 percent men and i've and i've gone around i started to i have this term dude land sorry <laughs> if i'm over emphasizing one lens right now but like dude land is a is a show or something where it's like it's all dudes it's too many dudes and it's not like the military or something where it it probably should be dude land, you know, but sometimes it's just like, what, you know, and, and I even bring this lens sometimes to old TV shows and some of them have gender parity and some of them don't. It's interesting to see, but yeah. no, Martha Wells is, is, does a great job. That's Very a good human point. Or, that people. That's a, because yeah, it's a really good point because we want our worlds to seem real, right? Yeah. I do. I, when I world building, I want people to get immersed and, think they're there. I mean, I, I want it to be realistic enough that it's believable, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it's, but we're also finding the cultural expectations of our audience too. Yeah. Yeah. All, All right. right. I, Any questions? I I'm going to start to <laughs> dial us back in a little bit. Um, uh, Paul, are you working on a question? Are you, were you going to type in a question? Because mm -hmm. I was going to let you give you a chance. Nope, you're good. Okay. So um, uh, let me give you guys a minute to kind of to kind of close up a little bit, and and that way uh, just say thank you for being here. So uh, if you guys share, I'll well, start with thank you, Louise, for you know staying up late with us and joining oh, us all the way from to the that. other side of the country, and um, thank you, Paul, for hanging with us the whole time um, yeah. and sharing your perspective because that's valuable, and um, thank you, Bob, for for, you know, making this all happen. Um, <laughs> um, in, in closing, I guess my, my, my takeaway from this is that once I know what I know, I, I can't unknow it. And I do see, I come to the work differently. And so depending on how egregious I believe the, the, the boundary, of the, um, the overreach or the, you know, the, the inappropriate behavior or the statements in the world are with the, the person's worldview um, butts up against mine. I guess that the more egregious I feel it is, the more I'm going to see it in the work and relate it to the work and have trouble with the work. So I don't know that I could, that I can separate the artist from the art, the writer from the work. I have a similar takeaway um, at a certain point, I can't help but have trouble reading a, a, any or viewing any kind of artistic endeavor if, if I know that they behaved in a despicable way. Although I'm willing to engage in some moral relativism with 
past lives and I'm willing to forgive as people do things wrong and, and, and are honest with themselves in the world. Um, so I'm open to all that stuff. I'm also completely willing to learn from the uh, sons of guns. Like they, they're, I'm willing to learn from the way that there are geniuses in every population and I'm willing to learn from the geniuses in another population like all the whites is <laughs> trained men out there. I will learn and then go on and do my, my own thing. Thank you for having me and thank you guys for, uh, it's such a delight to talk with people who are so well versed in the issues and, and what's out there. Thank you. I just scheduled a Zoom. I'm not smart at all. Um, uh, I, this has been great. I, you know, because you, you and I haven't been able to talk for since the last time you were out for a book festival. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> thank you me. both again um, for listening and thank you to our audience for being here for this edition of the Brick Cave Webcastinar Event Zoomopolis. I got it right. <laughs> oh. Entitled Can You Separate the Writer from the Work with Louise Robertson and Sharon Skinner? The archive of this video will be made available to viewers and subscribers of the Brick Cave YouTube page, and the audio will be released as a Brick Cave podcast. Thank you again to our guests, Sharon Skinner and Louise Robertson, for taking the time to be with us tonight. Sharon can be found online at SharonSkinner.com, and you can support Louise through her Patreon at Patreon.com slash Louise Robertson. So always feel free to, uh, to support our artists. Of course, their books are available at your favorite bookstore, or you can order them direct online from BrickCaveMedia.com. With that, I will turn off the recording, and uh, I'm going to let you guys just kind of keep going if you want. So, and bam. <laughs>